Hello everyone, this is Ron Bush with Ron Bush Consulting and welcome to the Information Playground. The Information Playground is a, uh, is a program that is dedicated to enlightening people and educating folks not only in technology, which you would expect, but also in leaders and business and throughout life's different industries. So um, Ron Bush Consulting is a, a consultancy that's dedicated to cybersecurity. If you're interested in finding out more, check out my website, ronbushconsulting.com. Check out my book on Amazon. It's called Staying Safe in a Very Dangerous World. Think before you click. Uh, you can also um, check out the, uh, uh, the website uh, for WVLP. That's the radio station that we started on. WVLP is uh, uh, a local or uh, yeah, local FM station in Valparaiso, Indiana. If you're there, it's 103.1 FM. If you're not, you're welcome to stream us on that. We're on Monday mornings from eight to nine and Friday afternoons from one to two where they rebroadcast Monday show. Um, it's uh, WVLP.org. Uh, excellent radio station. I encourage you just to check out the, the website. They, they do a lot in the community and you can become involved that way. If you're interested in underwriting this program or any of the others, they welcome that. You can uh, get a hold of uh, Greg Kovich at info at wvlp.org. If you're looking at this on demand, maybe you want to go back and review some things. Uh, you can find us on just about any of the podcast stations. Uh, always Spotify, Apple Podcast, and Google Podcast come to mind, but, but there's six or seven others. Um, and you can find us on YouTube. If uh, you'd like to look at uh, my smiling face and my guest today, who is Jake Jaquint, Jake I apologize, Jake. Um, welcome to find us on YouTube, and you'll find previous broadcast as well on YouTube. So with that, Jake, tell the folks a little bit about yourself. Hey, Ron, thank you so much. I'm glad to be here, and uh, thanks for the great introduction. My name's Jake Jaquint. I'm the CEO of a company called Cash is King. That's right. Cash is in money. Yes. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be here. My business focuses on tax planning work. So we work with small businesses to help them save money on their taxes. And um, I'm excited to be here, Ron. I'm a big fan and opportunity to look at uh, or listen to some previous podcasts. So I'm excited to be here. Great. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on the program. Um, let's talk a little bit. How'd you get started with tax planning? Of all the things that I can think of, now, cybersecurity isn't the most fascinating nor interesting, but tax planning, you know, that's, that's an awful lot of regulations and stuff. How'd you get started? Yeah, well, it wasn't in tax. Let's put it that way. I <laughs> started off, uh, you know, when you think of tax, most people don't think of it as some exciting field, like you said, Ron. It's uh, uh -huh. not. But I actually started off providing uh, chief financial officer work for small businesses. So basically companies that needed a fractional CFO, um, someone to help out in forecasting and driving their business and really, you know, thinking about how they're going to grow their business moving forward. So I actually started off on the finance end of things. And what happened was probably, and I started off 10 years ago, so it was probably two years after I started, one of my clients who had his, uh, his name's actually Richard, he's actually still with me. And he had a, a very successful business. And one day he came to me, he had just filed his taxes and said, hey, I just paid $60,000 in taxes, right? And it's just painful. And that means he's doing a great job, right? If you're paying 60,000 taxes, Ron, it means you, you've done pretty well for yourself. Yeah, you've at least made more than that, exactly. Right, you made a lot more than that. But still, <laughs> paying 60,000 is a, a big number, hard to swallow. And he came back to me, he's like, man, I was talking to my CPA and they're just like, it is what it is. You've got to pay this money, that's what you get for being successful. Yeah. And uh, I looked at him and I said, geez, I'm like, well, what do you, I asked him, you know, because he was wanting to know if there was a way to reduce that amount. And he asked me if there, if I could help him out. And I said, I asked him a question. I said, are you putting any money away for retirement? And he said, no. 
And right then I realized, hey, I could help him out. I could reduce the amount of taxes he's paying just with that one question alone. And that was really the light bulb moment for me that um, pivoted my business a little bit. You know, we still do CFO work, but I started realizing, hey, I can help clients save serious money. I'm talking tens of thousands of dollars um, just by helping them out with tax planning. And, and that's how I got started. So I got to give a, a big thank you to my client, Richard. Uh, he was the one and his big tax bill is $60,000. But that was the start of uh, my pivot into tax planning. And uh, it, it's, been, it's been great since then. That's great. Now, tax planning and tax prep, there's a difference. What is it? What's the difference between those two things? Because the they're both important. They are, they are. And, and there's a very distinct difference. So tax preparation is the same as tax filing, right? So here in the US, we're all fortunate enough that we have to pay taxes every year. And that's what tax preparation is, is you have to have someone, a CPA, an enrolled agent, you could use TurboTax or H&R Block, but someone has to file taxes for you and your business. So tax preparation is really just, um, it's a cost, it's compliance work. You have to do it. It's like having insurance for your car. You have to have it. And the difference between them is, is the tax prep is that compliance work, it's that cost, but there's really no difference between one tax preparer and another. It's like shopping for the car insurance. They're both pretty much the same, maybe a few different bells and whistles, but you know, you're, they're just gonna file your taxes. Tax planning is completely different. Tax planning is the process of legally shielding your income from taxes. Okay, so the, the IRS, I'm sure most people hear about tax planning as a different word, as loopholes. Yeah. So most people, Ron, I'm not sure if, if you've heard of this. I think you have of these, these loopholes that typically people associate with wealthy individuals, right? Okay. Hey, these wealthy guys are taking advantage of the IRS tax code and these IRS tax loopholes, and they're shielding their money from, from taxation. And uh, that's what it is. So tax planning is how to legally use the IRS tax code to shield your, your money from taxation. So instead of paying 60,000, how can we only pay 20,000 in tax? Yeah. So those are differences there. And another difference with that is tax preparation or filing your taxes, that's a once a year event, right? So at the end of the year, you file your taxes. Tax planning is something that you're doing really every month, every quarter throughout the year. You're actually planning. There's work involved with it to to heal that money from taxation. So that's the major differences between the two. And it's it's a great question, Ron. A lot of people are get confused when they hear about tax planning. They assume it's just filing taxes. Oh, it's the same as tax preparation, but it's not. It's completely different. So 30 some years ago, uh, I don't know, 35, maybe close to 40 years ago, I got into uh, financial planning. Nowadays, they're called wealth managers. Yes. But, uh, but financial planning. And, and I remember working for a, 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 a gentleman who specialized in limited partnerships. Now, laws have changed dramatically since then. In, the, in those days, it was very common to hear about doctors and other professionals that made a lot of money back then. I don't think doctors make that kind of money today, thanks to <laughs> other changes that have gone on. But back then, um, I remember him talking about how he put them in investments that were almost guaranteed to lose money. I never quite grabbed hold of that logic. I'd rather give it to the government. If I got to give it to somebody, why give it to someone to lose it? At least the, the tax dollars will go back and benefit somebody. I may not always agree with it, but at least it benefits somebody. And so... I never had anything to do with that stuff, but I remember that, you know, all that, 
that stuff that was happening. What was legal then is not legal now. You're not allowed to use those shelters. So let's talk a little bit. Shielding sure. money from the IRS, and you've stressed legal shielding several times. Yes. Let's talk about the legality. Is tax planning legal? And I'm sure you approach it from a legal aspect. Devote some time to that, if you would. Yeah, no, it's, it's great because I think a lot of people, like you had said, Ron, or a lot of people look at some wealthy people and wonder, how are you getting away with this? Yeah. How are you paying less in taxes? And I think a lot of people wonder, are they doing something illegal? Yeah. And not that there aren't people like that out there, okay? We got criminals all over, unfortunately, but right. tax loopholes are actually laws that were passed by the United States Congress mm -hmm. that actually provide certain benefits to certain individuals who happen to be business owners. Yeah. So they're completely legitimate. They're completely legal. They've been passed by our Congress, the people we vote for, and they're out there. And so what ends up happening is, is along the way, there's, all, there's laws being passed all the time in the country. And every time there's some big, huge law like health care or taxes, there's all these other small little laws that are passed along with those bills. And these tax loopholes are actually some of those small little, you know, passages that are in these bills. And they give benefits to business owners. So they got passed over years and years and years. And what's happened is over time is laws get passed and they typically stay on the books forever. So what's happened now is we have roughly 67 of these, what we call tax planning strategies, which other people call loopholes, uh -huh. which Congress has passed over time. And it's really come from you know, lobbying almost or a business owner talking to their congressperson saying, hey, you know what would really help me, Ron, is I've got a problem and I would love to be able to write this off as an expense for my business, um, but really the money's gonna go into my pocket. And you know, the congressperson's like, that sounds like a great idea. And, you know, if, uh, if I've got your vote uh, in the next upcoming election, I'll try to pass this along in Congress. And that's how it actually has started off. And that's how it continues on to this day. Uh, there's always these loopholes. And I tell everyone, Ron, I, I don't know about you, but I have two young kids. And I know when I was going into college, you know, 30 years ago, I applied for all these, um, you know, grants. And I remember these grants were really weird. You know, some of them were for, hey, if you have a focus or if your background is from this part of the country or if you're from, you know, if you're Native American, you know, there's some money available to you. And then there are some really weird ones where if you were a left-handed saxophone player, right. you know, there's money for you. And that's what these loopholes are for. Mm -hmm. So uh, these loopholes, they don't apply to every business owner and every person, but certain ones apply to certain people. And they're available for people to take full advantage of legally. And it's, uh, it's great. I love it. I love helping people <laughs> make money. And this is a great way. And thank you to our government for allowing this to happen. Uh, I, uh, that's great. Um, you know, not this election, at least I haven't heard it this election, but the previous one, Somebody, and I really can't remember, and I, this is not an excuse to go political. I, I don't do that on this program. <laughs> but uh, I remember them saying that it was wrong for uh, a businessman to pay less in taxes than a secretary paid who made considerably less than him. It was a big deal at the time. So you've mentioned it. Let's, let's delve into that. Is tax yes. planning only for wealthy business owners? It's not. It's not, and it does, it has that name. And you're right, Ron, it's every election year this comes up at some point, right? Everyone's like, oh, we gotta close these loopholes. And yeah. how can Warren Buffett pay less as a percentage of taxes than his secretary? That's, that's not right. that's fair. What it is. Yeah. And, and that's what it is. And um, it's something that comes up all the time, but never actually changes. And the truth to the matter is these, 
loopholes, these tax strategies, are available to all business owners, not just the ones who make a ton of money. Mm -hmm. They're available to you and your business and me and my business. And it's an, it's an equal play game, so to speak. So they're available to everyone. I think the tough part about it is um, that most people aren't aware of it, mm -hmm. right? And it's mostly the people who aren't making a whole lot of money. Because with tax planning, there's work involved, there's an investment you do have to make in order to get some of these savings, although it's a small investment compared to the return you get on it. But I think what it is, is every year, like you said, Ron, when we hear this, when there's an election, it's always about the, the wealthy guy, yeah. the richest people in the world. And so therefore, I think the average American, the average business owner, things that it's not available to them and they don't understand that it is. And really the issue comes back to, in my opinion, and, and this is just my opinion, is that most business owners, they honestly believe that the CPA that they have, that files taxes for them, the tax preparation, they believe that they're actually saving them money. That's what they think they're paying for. People you know, they know it's a compliance thing. They know when they have to file taxes, but they also believe that their CPA is there to try to shield their money from, from taxation and save them money. But that's really not the case. In the overwhelming majority of cases, CPAs are strictly doing tax preparation. They're doing tax filing. So these, these people who might not think these tax loopholes are available to them, or even if they do think they are available to them, they think their CPA is taking care of them. They think that they're getting everything that they, you know, they think they're taking advantage of all these loopholes, when in reality they're not. And that's not because the CPA is doing a bad job. I, I don't want to say that because my firm is consists of CPAs. Uh -huh. It's just that they're focused on tax preparation. So I always compare it to like a doctor. You have the general practitioner, right? You go to the doctor, you have the sniffles, you go to them, they do some blood work and they find out that, hey, you have cancer. Well, then they send you to a different doctor. And you go to the oncologist at that point, right? So you gotta go to a specialist. And it's the same thing with taxation is that you know, your CPA is doing general work. They're just checking you out. They're doing just compliance stuff. But if you really want to save a lot of money, you need some different help, typically from a tax planner that's going to really be able to focus in on the issues that you're having and find these solutions that will help save you money. So it's available to everybody, although most people don't realize that. You know, my business works a lot the same way. I, I'm in cybersecurity. I consult on that. But most people think I'm an IT guy. The mm -hmm. IT department or the IT vendor or who, whatever it is you're using at your company, they're there to make sure the printers print, the, the computers compute, and the network runs. They're not there to do cybersecurity. They're, most of them are, have no training. They have no knowledge about it. Some of the worst passwords I've encountered came from IT directors. My first experience with QWERTY is a password. That's just the, the letters on the top of the keyboard. <laughs> that was an IT director. So <laughs> don't call me if you're having trouble with your printer. Call me if you want to, to uh, protect your data, protect your company's data, your, your employees, your clients or patients, whatever the case might be. That's what you call me for exactly right, right along with your example. Yeah, absolutely. It's true. And, and, and so, and don't expect your IT department to, to do the other. There's frankly, just thanks to technology and science in particular, and in your case, Congress people who love to pass laws, uh, <laughs> there's just simply too much to know, to know everything. None of us do. No one does. And anyone that claims to, I, I'm suspicious of. Oh, talk for, for my specialty, which is cybersecurity, talk to your IT people for, for keeping the, the systems running. In your case, 
it sounds like it's call you. Now your company has CPAs, so call your company now. You can, uh, you can bring in CPAs, it sounds like, to do the prep and, and the filing, but talk to you to prepare for it and to prepare right. for next year. And I think, as in the example you had with, with cybersecurity, it's, you know, people don't probably think about cybersecurity until they've been hacked. Yes. Or until an issue's happened, right? And I'm, I'm sure that's probably frustrating. You wish they would have thought about it before, before the fire was burning down their home. That's right. And we're in the same situation, right? Most people don't think about taxes until they file their taxes at the end of the year. Right? <laughs> then they have to write a check. Right. <laughs> and that's, if, you, if we go back to how I got started in my story about my client, Richard, it started when he had to write a $60,000 check. And, you know, we always tell people, I'm like, you know, it's, it's hard and people don't think about taxes, but that one time a year. And I think that's why they're not thinking more about it. They go through that pain, they bang their head, and then they, you know, they forget about it. 12 months later, they're like, oh my gosh, I just wrote out another huge check. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. I'm paying more than what my car's worth. So it's, uh, we always tell people that tax planning is really something that needs to happen throughout the year. Hence the word planning. Right, it's something you have to plan for, so that when it comes to that time, just like in cybersecurity, if you don't plan for it, eventually your data is going to get hacked. Right? I mean, if you, we hear about it all the time, if a major retailer doesn't think about cybersecurity, well, guess what's going to happen? They're going to think about it the minute you know they get hacked. And uh, so I'm, I'm not sure if your business works that way. I think it probably does, but most people end up calling you after the pain's already occurred. Yeah. In which case I point them to forensics people because I don't clean up the mess and I don't do the investigation. <laughs> I, I, I point them to the FBI. IC3.gov is the website to file the, the breach. And I, I point them to, to forensics people that go in and, and investigate and then clean up the mess. My job is to prevent it. And, uh, and you're exactly right. Uh, in fact, yeah. I didn't realize it. We are an awful lot of like different industries to be sure, but, but the job, yeah. Uh, yeah. the job itself, <laughs> a lot of similarities there. Don't come and tell me you, you just, you got to pay the IRS 60 grand and expect me to work the miracle after it's already happened. It's, yeah. uh, no, there's planning involved with it. And, um, you know, again, I think that's what, what happens is people don't think about it until they fall down and feel that pain. They're not thinking they're going to get hurt until they get hurt. And it happens, especially as you run a business, you know, the, hey, as your business, as you start off, typically we don't all start off hitting home runs. Right. You know, the business starts off slowly. We're, we're breaking, we're not making money and then we're breaking even. And then suddenly, you know, if you didn't pay taxes for the first few years because you didn't make money, you're not thinking about tax planning. But suddenly when you do well, it becomes a problem. Yeah. And although paying taxes means you're making money, and therefore you're thinking the more you pay in taxes, the more I made, so that's good. There's still a way to reduce that amount that you're paying and, uh, you know, put it towards things that you want to do and money that uh, you can spend on, on what makes you happy. Well, that sounds great. Let's talk about some uh, tax planning strategies. What, uh, what, what's some examples or what's an example? Sure. Well, I got to be careful. I don't want to give away the secret sauce here. Right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> because if, if I told you everything, then you'd go out and do it on your own. But <laughs> I, I, do, I do like to go through and uh, at least provide one example to clients of what this really looks like. Because people, a lot of times, as you can imagine, they, again, the elections come around, as we talked about. They hear how the rich business owner pays less in taxes than their secretary, but they don't know how that's even possible. So one of the uh, strategies that I love to use, and, and Ron, I, I don't know if you're a golfer. Or if you, are, you, are you a golfer, Ron? I probably should take up croquet, but yes, I do get out on the... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> on the greens now and then. I walk by him. I spend a lot of time in the rough. But yeah, I, I golf. I didn't ask you if you were good. Because <laughs> <laughs> we, 
Maybe I should have asked if you swing golf clubs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. Sometimes I actually hit the ball with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Listen, I think my kids to putt putt. I think that's good enough. <laughs> But, but my favorite loophole actually, and the reason I asked about the golfing is my favorite loophole actually came about because of golf. And so uh, the major golf tournament in the U.S. every year is the Masters Golf Tournament. It's held in the springtime. And the Masters is held in a town in Georgia called Augusta. Uh -huh. So it's in Augusta, Georgia. It's on the Augusta Golf Course. And there's actually a tax strategy it's called the Augusta Loophole. So <laughs> it's named after golfing. And I like to bring it up because, you know, if, if people golf, they, they know it. If people don't golf, at least they've heard of the Masters or they might know of Augusta. And what ended up happening was, is, and again, laws are passed typically because of wealthy people influencing, you know, our Congress uh, people. Yes. What ended up happening is wealthy business owners happened to own houses on golf courses. Uh -huh. Why? Well, they're beautiful. Who doesn't want to be on a golf course, especially the most well-known one in the U.S.? Uh -huh. And so these business owners are always thinking about saving money on taxes. So uh -huh. they wanted to come up with a way in which they could do that taking advantage of their homes, which are on the golf course. So what they did is they said, hey, we want to hold a board meeting and we want to hold our board meeting instead of a conference room somewhere at a hotel or a resort. I want to hold it at the house that I own in Augusta, Georgia, that happens to be on this golf course. And I happen to want to hold these board meetings while the Masters Golf Tournament's going on. So, I mean, again, it sounds really crazy, right? That uh -huh. here we are, a business owner is going to try to convince, you know, our Congress people that, hey, I want to rent out my home to a business that I own. Right. And I'm going to hold a board meeting that so happens to be while Tiger Woods and <laughs> Phil Mickelson are on a golf course playing golf at the biggest golf tournament in the world. <laughs> uh, I imagine when I tell this story, Ron, that people have got to be like, this is the craziest thing in the world. Yeah. But it's completely true. So what ended up happening is this, and this is how the loophole works. And it's written into law now. So basically, as a business owner, even as an individual business owner, meaning a one-person owner, you own 100% of your company, you are still required by the government to hold board meetings. And people know this. You get the paperwork when you sign up your business with the IRS. You get your tax ID number. They send you this, but no one really holds board meetings, right? I mean, you're, you're a one-person show. But legally, you're supposed to be doing it. Even if it's with yourself. Even if you're sitting in a mirror talking to yourself, that's a board meeting. Uh -huh. So what you're allowed to do is the Augusta loophole allows you as a business owner to rent out your home to the business for 14 days a year to hold board meetings. So how it works is, is so let's say you, Ron, will use your business, Ron Bush Consulting. You can then rent your home out to yourself, or I'm sorry, you can rent your home to your business. Okay. So you send in a paper invoice to your business. You say, hey, it's gonna be $1,000 a day and you can, I'm gonna rent out my home to you. So the business pays you this money, okay? It's rent, it's an expense for the business, which therefore lowers their taxable income for the business. Now you as an individual have to claim that income on your tax statement. So you have to claim this is rental income. The Augusta loophole allows you as the individual to deduct that income 100 percent so what's happened now is is ron bush consulting has created a, an expense for 14 days a year for for rental for a board meeting and then ron gets claims that income but can write it off because of that tax loophole so basically we have 
sent money right from your business into your pocket tax-free. And that's an example of how the loopholes work, not only in how crazy they sound, I mean, really how it started is laughable, right? But here it is, our, our Congress, which we're all very proud of, you know, not a, the House and the Senate, and signed by a president, said, hey, business owners are allowed to do things like this. And that's how it works. So it's basically taking money from your business it's an expense for the business, which lowers your taxable income, which means you pay less in taxes. It gives it to you, the business owner, as an individual that you don't have to pay taxes on. Uh -huh. So though that is an example of a loophole that uh, to me, and, it, and believe it or not, it's not even the craziest one. It's just the one that I think people can relate to the most uh, because of the golfing uh, reference to it. And uh, that's how it works. That's fascinating. Now, you remind me, again, this is going back. I don't know if it still exists or not, but I remember learning about a, a generation skipping trust that I think was developed for Rockefeller. He didn't want to give his kids any money, but he loved his grandson. If I, 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 I may have the details all wrong, but, but that's how that one was written. Is that? It is. It's, 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 it's crazy. It, it, it really is mind boggling how some of them work. Now, some of them are, are really good ones. Like, hey, putting money into investments, a 401k, yeah. a SEP IRA, just investing for retirement, you know, things like that. Those are really considered loopholes, tax strategy that you can take advantage of. And those ones make sense, right? right. Hey, you know, regular employees at big businesses have retirement plans and pension plans and you know, those are available to small business owners too, but there's a lot of these loopholes that are just really, you know, they boggle my mind how they came up with them. Um, but again, I think people, because they hear them, they think they can't be true. Yeah. yeah. Right, Ron? And I think that's where people wonder about the legality of it. And I just pull out the IRS tax code and say, go Google it yourself. You'll see it <laughs> right there. It's so black and white. And, uh, and hey, they're for you to take advantage of. And there's no reason why you shouldn't. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, that's how crazy it can get. But that's the favorite one I like to talk about because I think it really points out just how different that some business owners think. And you got to think when it comes down to it, when you're successful, some of your biggest expenses is your taxes. How much you pay every year in taxes is a huge expense for most people. You know, one of the top five that you have. So finding ways to lower that legally should be something that you're focusing on. But like your business, cybersecurity, people tend not to think about it until it's already happened. And um, so what I try to do out there is, is reach out to people ahead of time and say, hey, you know, if you're paying taxes, if you've got a large tax bill, let's talk about ways in which we can reduce that. That's great. Listen, we're going to take a short break. Um, I want everybody to, to stay tuned. When we come back, we're going to talk about how much money a business can save with tax planning. But before we go there, um, I want to advise everyone, first off, if you're catching us on radio, you're listening to WVLP. I encourage you as a, as a listener to, to go to the website, wvlp.org. They're in Valparaiso, Indiana, and they're a great radio station, and they do a lot in the community. You can be part of that. Check out WVLP.org. If you'd like to underwrite this program or some of the other programs, uh, I'm sure they would welcome uh, uh, any kind of, uh, of help that you, you want to give. You can also check this program out. It's called The Information Playground, and there's other podcasts and YouTube channels with similar names, so you have to get all three of those words in there, the information playground. We're available on most of the podcast platforms and we're available on YouTube. So by all means, check us out. If you're interested in the cybersecurity side of things for your business, and I hope you are, I hope you're doing something, if not with me, with someone that is qualified and dedicated to, to help you protect your business reputation and your data. Um, but if you're interested in checking me out, it's ronbushconsulting.com. 
uh, send an email to ron at ronbushconsulting.com. And um, Jake, how can people, if they've got questions, uh, want to pursue a conversation with you, how can they reach out to you? The best way to get a hold of me, Ron, is they can send me an email. And my email address is jake at cash is king, C N Y. That's Jake at cash is king, and then three letters C is in Charlie, N is in Nancy, Y is in yo yo.com. Great, great. So, um, how much money? <laughs> and I realize it's all going to depend. You know, Google's going to save a little more money than mom and pop uh, shoe, shoe shine parlor or something. But how much money can business can a business save with tax planning? Let's get right to it, right, Ron? It's all about yeah. money. <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. That's why my business name is Cash is King, right? Because it's, yeah. it's really about money at the end. It does differ. It, it, it does differ. Um, so in some cases, I mean, depending on the business, and it's not just the business, Ron. <clears throat> a lot of it's also the business owner and their personal side of things. So some of these, these tax laws are written so it's not just about what the business does, but it's also about the individual, right? So if we go back to like the Augusta loophole that I was describing, that's for business owners who actually own a home. So I was talking to a business owner the other day who rents his home. Mm -hmm. So the Augusta loophole doesn't apply to him. So it's not just about your business. It's about the business owner as a whole and what not only the business itself, but them personally in their personal situation. So it depends uh, on the actual individual case. But in some cases, my large, my largest savings have been six figures, over $100,000 a year. Wow. Savings that they can have. Um, on the low end, the smallest that we work with is, you know, for my firm anyways, and there's other people can, can, can do less, but we only work if we think we can save you a minimum of $10,000 a year. Because at that point, it tends to be you know, really worthwhile. You know, if I said I can only save you a thousand, it's like, man, nah, geez, there's a lot of work involved and it's only a thousand. So, we work with folks that we can save a minimum of $10,000 a year on. Our biggest clients will save over a hundred, but on average, it's right around the mid twenties, depending on the exact situation that people are in. Um, and obviously in some cases, it is the more money you make, the more savings there are, but there are some strategies that you're, you're limited. There's only a certain amount that you can deduct in your taxes for that. But I would say our average is around twenty-five thousand, but it can be it can be six figures or more, no doubt about it. It just uh, really depends on your individual situation. I appreciate, I appreciate that. that. You know, I uh, you mentioned it earlier a couple of times, and just now, the cash is king. I'm I'm often troubled when I when I watch the news, and I think the press and and politicians both have have encouraged this. When people talk about wealth as though it's a dirty thing, we're a capitalist country. The idea is to make money. And as I've got, I've got clients that are not for profits and I tell them the same thing. If you don't have money, you don't have a mission. Right. Uh, you've got to stay in business in order to do what it is that, that you're called to do. And I, and a, you know, one calling is not better than another. Uh, you can shine shoes for a living and you can uh, create uh, search engines and uh, uh, web browsers and everything else. Uh, uh, make, uh, you know, smartphones and, uh, and tablets and uh, desktop computers. doesn't matter what you do, but you, in order to keep doing it, you've got to have income to do it. And a lot of things enter into that. It bothers me when they talk about how unimportant the stock market is. Well, lots of folks have 401ks, and a lot of those folks are working, if not minimum wage, uh, they're around it. Yeah. Um, a lot of times they are minimum wage, and the company devotes uh, uh, or uh, dedicates money for that purpose to, to help them. Well, those up and downs in the, in the stock market, that affects them just like it does Warren Buffett and, and Bill Gates. So it, it's funny when you say that wealth is sometimes a dirty word. Right. It, it really is. 
but what do we all want to be? <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny that, like you said, every year when there's an election, we always talk about that wealthy guy paying less in taxes. And we're all mad at that wealthy guy, but we all want to be that wealthy person, right? You know, I mean, people might be, you know, like you said, I think the stock thinks so and such and such about the stock market. But man, yesterday, I can tell you, we all, or the day before yesterday, we all wanted to be in on the stock market, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, we all want to, we all want to provide for ourselves. We want to provide for our families. And you're right. A lot of people out there, and I get it a lot of times. Oh, geez. Well, I want to be able to pay my fair share of taxes because taxes do. The point of taxes is to really help everybody, right? Roads, bridges, and so on. But it doesn't mean you have to pay more than what the government tells you you need to pay. Right. And, and most folks that, that talk about that, there's nothing that keeps them from devoting or from giving more money. You can give money to the IRS anytime you want to. Right. Listen, it, it's um, it, exactly. And it's just uh, wealth is not a dirty word. Um, hey, listen, I'll, and this is the way I look at it, Ron. As long as you're doing things legally, you know, and morally, then, then do it. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with doing it. There's lots of great charities out there that you can donate your money to and and uh, and go from there. But yeah, it's not a dirty word and it's, it's available to everyone and we all just need to take advantage of it and, and go from there. We're all going to be better off about it. If you think about it, Ron, mm -hmm. if we all pay a little bit less in taxes, you think, well, that can't be good. How do we get all these bro roads and bridges? Well, when you save that money, what do people do when they when they make more money? What do they typically do when they make more? They spend more. They, they spend more, <laughs> right? I'll tell you what. Uh, you know, I I, I, had a, I moved into this home uh, three years ago that I'm in. I mean, it was an older home that hadn't had much updating, and man, I've been plowing money into it. I made more money last year than I did the year before. What did I do? I didn't save any more of it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I wanted to build more in the house. I wanted to update windows and put in this and put in that. So it's uh, when people say, oh, geez, we should be paying more in taxes. Well, if you think about it, we're all spending more. The more money that's circulating in the economy, it's, it's really good for everybody. Yeah. So there's no reason why you wouldn't take advantage of it. So Yeah, those, those painters and... Uh, uh window installers and all the rest of them that you paid are probably grateful that you made that extra money because that helped oh, yeah. you extra money. Because they made extra money, right? Yeah. So tell me something. Do all CPAs, you, you addressed this earlier, but let's go a little deeper. Do all CPAs provide tax planning services? That's a great question. And the answer is no. Um, not all do. And, it, and a lot of it, again, goes back to a our examples in your example, you know, as you said, hey, cybersecurity is kind of thought of as an IT function, but it's really a specialty. You know, you're not going to go in and fix someone's printer today or computer. And it's the same thing with CPAs. Although we're CPAs, our focus is in this very specific area of tax planning. So we're really more of specialists, where most CPAs out there really they're specializing in tax returns, tax preparation, filing taxes with the IRS. And it's just a different model, right? And, and there's, it doesn't mean they're doing something wrong or it doesn't mean I'm doing something right. We're just really focusing on two separate things. Their business is really a, a high volume business. You know, they're doing lots of tax returns. They're doing them in a very short amount of time. And, you know, it's always rush, rush, rush. And, and they're doing it after something's already happened, which happens to be the end of the fiscal year. The fiscal year ends and then they go to work. With tax planning and tax planners, um, our work is really even throughout the year. We're constantly working and our one goal is to find ways to reduce taxable income. And one thing I think, Ron, that is important to to review that I didn't think about earlier, but now that I said reduced taxable income is, tax planning is not about cutting expenses. Okay, so a lot of people think, well, geez, how are you gonna save me money? You know, are you just going to tell me to 
um, get a smaller office or cut back my staff today or pay less. That's not what tax planning is, okay? Tax planning has nothing to do with you cutting expenses, has nothing to do with, hey, I can save you money, but you gotta do more. You gotta sell more. No, that's not what it is. It's not about either one of those. It's simply saying, we are going to take your exact current position you're in, no more money, no more income, no more expenses, but we are going to apply laws to what you're doing that will lower your taxable income. So I think that's really important to distinguish here that we don't come in there's because there are certain people, not CPAs typically, but there's consultants who will come in and be like, you're overpaying uh, the people in, on the production floor today. If you cut their salaries, you can make more money. That's not what we do. We take what you're currently doing and we take these loopholes and just apply them. So that's really the difference. So CPA is really going to take what you've done after the fact and just file your taxes. We're going to go through out the year and tell you what you need to do to take advantage of all the loopholes that you can in, in order to uh, you know, lower your taxable income. And to be clear on, on another thing, Ron, I, I know earlier I mentioned that there's 67 loopholes. You'd be lucky as an individual if eight of them applied to you. Okay, so when they're out there, again, we all have unique situations. You know, if eight of them fit you, that would be a lot. Typically, most people, there's five or six that apply to you in your situation. So it's not like, oh my God, there's 67 opportunities to save. That's, that, that doesn't happen. But um, I just wanted to point that out as well. Yeah, I appreciate that. So I've heard of tax planning and I've, uh, you know, I've worked um, for years in, in this area, but an awful lot of people haven't. It's been around, I assume, since taxes have been around or maybe not, maybe shortly thereafter, but um, it just seems one needs to follow the other. If you're going to pay, well, maybe you ought to plan for the next year to, to take advantage of, of the laws that Congress has passed. How come most people haven't heard of it? You know, that's a great question. Uh, I think for, I think there's two reasons for it. Again, I think when you start off in, in your business, it's when think, people think about tax, they're thinking about filing their taxes at the end of the year. They're thinking about tax preparation. So they get hooked up with, with someone who does that. And they, you know, they, I think they assume mm -hmm. that it's being done when they're filing their taxes. And, um, and that's really just a gross misrepresentation of what's happening. And I think it's just, hey, you foul people at chow time, right? How do you find out where the, where the dining hall is? You just foul someone else. Mm -hmm. So as business owners, when we start off, um, we're like, hey, we need someone to file taxes. And we think that by doing that, that that person is specifically trying to find ways to take advantage of these different loopholes out there. And although most CPAs, they'll be like, hey, let's make sure we're deducting your cell phone bill and your internet, and let's make sure we're getting the mileage you're driving. That's basic stuff that most people are doing. And I think most business owners, Ron, just inherently think that if I have someone filing taxes for me, that they're also really taking a deep dive. But I think when you, if you step back and look at it, you know, if we go back to our doctor example, it's like if we go to the doctor and, you know, we don't have symptoms, the, the doctor doesn't know what's wrong with us, you know, and, and, and he's not a specialist either. So he's got to send you to someone else who's a specialist in a certain area. And we're specialists of saving money on taxes where most CPAs, most, I'd probably say 90, 95%, they're just specializing on, on returns. The everyday, hey, this is compliance work that we have to do with the IRS. And I think just, again, most business owners are just under an assumption. I, I know when I started that's, <laughs> If I knew this when I started, Ron, I would have started off doing tax planning, right? <laughs> but I didn't until finally someone asked me, why the heck am I paying so much in taxes? Yeah, yeah. 
well, the old saying, necessity is the motherhood of invention. That's, uh, that's when you realize there was, a, there was a need for this and you could fill it. So. Well, and it goes back, it's funny, that saying, what a great saying. Yeah. Because that's how these loopholes come about, right? Right. Someone who has money saying, hey, I don't want to pay taxes. What can I dream up to come up with some good excuse why not to pay taxes? I'm, I'm going to rent my home out to my own business and yeah. uh, call the board meeting and watch golf being played. <laughs> so it, it is the, the, the it is how inventions are come about. <laughs> so Jake, I've, I'm grateful you've been on the program today. We're at that time where we've just got a few minutes left. So let me ask you, um, I've asked a lot of questions. Do you have anything we should have covered? Anything I should have asked? Any final words? Listen, I, I think you covered a lot, Ron, and I'm glad to have been here today. My final words would be this is to anyone out there who's paying more than $10,000 a year in taxes, there are legal ways for you to reduce the amount of taxes you're paying, that you're paying, and there's no reason that you shouldn't take advantage of them. It's not just for the rich. It's not just for the wealthy. Um, and we all got into business to make money and to make a living and to provide for our family. So make sure, and I don't care who you use, you can reach out to me, call your local CPA, look up, find someone else. It doesn't matter who it is, but do this. There's nothing better than be able to provide for your family. And part of that is being able to have money. So uh, don't be afraid, don't be ashamed. Uh, reach out to me, reach out to anybody, but uh, there are definitely legal ways for you to lower your taxable income and, and pay less in taxes. So I advise everyone to do it. Excellent. One last time, give them the uh, email where they can contact you. Yep. So you can contact me at jake at cashiskingcny.com. Excellent. Well, thank you, Jake. And thank you folks for being with us today. This is the Information Playground. I'm Ron Bush. I own Ron Bush Consulting. Check out my website, Ron, uh, ronbushconsulting.com, or email me at ron at ronbushconsulting.com. If uh, you're interested in underwriting this on the demand platforms, um, send me an email. If you're interested in underwriting this on WVLP, uh, shoot an email to uh, Greg Kovich. Really nice guy. He's the station manager. Info at wvlp.org. Check out my book, uh, Staying Safe in a Very Dangerous World. Think Before You Click it is uh, available on Amazon. And join us next time. Again, you can find us on podcast platforms, find us on YouTube under the Information Playground, or find us on WVLP Monday mornings, 8 to 9, or Friday afternoons, 1 to 2. All that said, have a great week, folks, and thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye.